To be honest, sit down, we need to have a talk Cornelius gon' make a point that the others don't Them other shows sound the same, come and skate the box Expand your mind, dig into no controversial topics He ain't scared to keep it real Tune into this podcast, but don't be in your feelings We gon' have a laugh, we gon' talk about some pain Let's talk about the present situation of today Let me drop this thing off right. Yo, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Cornelius Lindsay, with another episode of To Be Honest. And I have an amazing guest here. She's been here before, Brittany King. Known her for years. When you talk about therapy and you talk about mental health and, um, like, I don't, I don't know a better person to think of than her. Okay. And it's not just the intellect that she has on the subject it is the character of the person that she is just being around her seeing her own journey and seeing how authentic she is it's just it's absolutely amazing so brit like i really appreciate you even being with I me right now you. that's so kind you know <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, I'm doing my best out here. You know, I, I've been out here fighting for my life with everybody else. Amen. <laughs> I feel you. So, Brett, I, I, uh, we had a, we, we had a conversation the other day mm-hmm. where, um, it was about the stigma of, of, uh, taking medication mm-hmm. for mental health. And one of the questions that I asked you was what were your thoughts the reason why i asked you the question was because i i spoke to a psychiatrist a couple weeks ago a week or so ago and the psychiatrist diagnosed me with moderate to severe depression and severe anxiety Mm -hmm. and then uh he prescribed me um zoloft Mm -hmm. and in 2020 i also saw i also saw a psychiatrist uh, the psychiatrist, I forgot what I was diagnosed with, but she prescribed me two different drugs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, I ain't going to do them. I'm going to just go to the gym, drink celery juice and pray to Jesus. And let's just say that it didn't work out. well. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I started this new journey. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 I had been talking to other people and I had so many people who were like, don't take it. Don't take it. Don't take it. Don't take it. And I, I specifically asked you the question by someone I respect and someone who understands the industry. I asked you that question, your thoughts on 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 taking the medication. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to give some background before I jump into that. Um, so I am a licensed professional counselor and I started my career working in college counseling centers, which was very special because I had the opportunity to work like kind of side by side with some really well tenured, good psychiatrists. So some of the misconceptions with medicine just start with understanding how all this works. So you have counselors like myself who provide therapy. Um, Some people do equine therapy, which is horses. I probably didn't pronounce that right. Right. I do traditional talk therapy. Um, But there's options there, right? Art therapy, music therapy, all the things. Then you have psychologists who are also qualified to do therapy, but they have a special ability to do um, testing. So being Mm -hmm. able to diagnose things like ADHD, autism, um, personality tests, different things like that. I can do some assessments, some mental health assessments. There are some that can only be done by psychologists. They have a doctorate degree in psychology. Mm -hmm. Then you have psychiatrists. Those are your medical doctors. They went to medical school. They did rotations in peds and psych, you know, and the psych unit. Right. And so they specialize in psychiatry and they are able to prescribe medication. So in my work as a therapist, I had the opportunity to work alongside some psychiatrists, which was a really unique experience for me. And helped me to have some insight on how the meds work, um, what meds are, you know, most beneficial for people, kind of what the process is with different medications and that sort of thing. And so I just wanted to give that background because I think 
when people hear and start the conversations of meds, it's just like an immediately no. <laughs> immediately no, because there's so much stigma about it. And I think just having some under some uh, understanding of like how all of this works together is important. Mm -hmm. So there's that. So boom. The question was, what do I think about, right? Like taking um, the medicine. And so part of what I shared with you on the phone was that the first psychiatrist that I worked with, I just loved him so much. He had been in the field like 30 plus years. And the way that he explained it to me was that sometimes when you're going through things like anxiety, depression, other mental health issues, the physical symptoms can be so strong and so intense for a person that is difficult to apply the skills that you learn in therapy. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I'm telling you, if I'm if I'm trying to teach you how to deep breathe, but it constantly feels like your chest is caving in, we might need to deal with that. <laughs> uh oh, do we free? Okay, there we go. Yeah. You know, like yeah. we might need to deal with that. And so right. what you do is you allow the medicine to help manage the physical symptoms. So that way, these other skills, praying, celery juice, going to the gym, <laughs> you know, so that those other skills can really take a hold because the physical symptoms aren't so bad. It's almost like trying to run a marathon with a broken foot. Mm. Something got to give. Right. Right. I, I love it. It's it's interesting because when you got when we got off the phone, I was talking to my wife about it and uh, my, our, our youngest son broke his arm. And so, you know, I look at her and I said, you know, it's so interesting because with him, we had to go see, I forgot what the doctor was called, um, an orthopedic, an orthopedic doctor. Mm -hmm. We had to go see an orthopedic doctor for him to get a cast on. Now, it wasn't enough for me to just take him to the, you know, just take him to like, you know, some, some quick, you know, medical clinic because he wow. needed a special doctor and he needed to put on the cast. And it's interesting because when, after he broke his arm, they gave him medication for pain. Mm -hmm. And while the pain helped to subside, you know, the, the issues that he was having with his arm, it didn't heal it. Mm -hmm. It just allowed for him to be, to mellow out so that his arm could heal. And I told, I was, I, my wife, I was like, man, the way that Brittany explained that was so good because it helped me to correlate that whole scenario mm -hmm. to say the same way that you know, Roman needed the medication to help ease his pain so that his arm could heal is the same way I can take this to help ease it so that I can, I can at least use the tools that I have. I haven't been able to use my tools, Brittany. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because there, there's two things at play, right? There's the chemical biological aspect of what you're experiencing. And then life is lifing. Yeah. And so you've got all this stuff going on. E even if life was perfect and daisies, there's still this very physical thing that's happening right. um, that's creating stress and um, depression and anxiety, right? And all these different emotions. And then you got, you know, life be out here lifing. You've been very <laughs> honest about that with the people. Yes. And yes. so, you know what I mean? When you combine those two things together, you need the additional support. Yeah. And that's okay. Yeah. And I, Brittany, I, I had gotten to a point where for me, it was like, I couldn't ignore the fact that I, I felt like I needed something. That's what you guys just kept telling Heather I needed something. So the point, it was like seeing my wife happy made me upset. Mm -hmm. You know, like seeing other people happy upset me, it would be like, I would just out of nowhere, just feel a sense of frustration and rage come up in my, 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 my chest. It's like, I could feel it. And then there are times I'd be really snappy with the kids and, you know, the kids haven't done anything wrong, but I, I had all these different things and I, I was so foggy brained. I'm, I, I can't be creative. I, I'm not leading proper. I can't do all these things. And I, I, I was like, yo, I got, I got to get help. Yeah, I got to get help. So there's this big stigma that is around it because I know so many others, specifically, and I'm not just saying it's just for some, but you know, most of the guys I talk to are black men. Mm -hmm. Specific amongst amongst all the black men I talk to, I would say, well, 100 percent of them right now are going through a very, very major transition and change in their life, whether or not 
there i got some who are getting a divorce i have some who are currently separated from their from their wife i have some who are who admit to me they are depressed i have some who are, who admit who uh, admit to me that they are you know contemplating taking their own lives mm -hmm. um, and i share my story with them and i hear crickets because of the stigma that's around it do you encounter that in your practice? Oh, for sure. For sure. I have clients on my caseload right now that, you know, we've talked about medicine, right? We have brought it up. I've introduced it and they're not ready um, or willing to go down that path. And that's okay. That's their right. They don't have to go down that path. Um, but what I like for people to know is that it is an option, right? I'm not one of those people that says you got to take the medicine. You got to take the medicine because I think that just adds to the stigma. Right. right. Just adds to the problem. There are good natural supplements out there in the world that help people. What I always tell people, I ain't a doctor. OK. OK. I know that it's out there. I know that it exists. I know things that I have tried. Right. But I don't know what other medicines you may be on. I don't know how different things interact with different things. And there comes a point where if you've tried everything, mm -hmm and you're still bumping up against that same wall, this could be chemical. Mm -hmm. And so psychiatrists are trained to listen for symptoms, to be able to understand how on a chemical biological level you are experiencing mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes what I will tell clients to do who are very resistant to that, at minimum, just go do the intake. Mm -hmm. Let them ask you the questions. Let them, because they're trained in ways that I'm not, and I'm okay. Not a medical doctor, okay? Praise God, everybody. Do not want to go to medical school. Blood, vomit, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Because they have to go through their rotations. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but they are trained. They are trained to hear things. I know how to diagnose. I've been trained to do that. On a biological level, they're trained to hear things that I may not know. Mm. So if it not, at minimum, you can do the intake and let them give you a more informed diagnosis um, and what some of your treatments are from that medical perspective, at least you know that there's a route. Right. A lot of the people that are saying don't take the medicine probably fall into a couple different schools of thought. Hmm. The school of thought is that the American medical system We'll just end that sentence there. <laughs> right? Like a lot of people have issues with Western medicine. They think that it discredits holistic naturopathic options and that it is more um, money based. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, then you have the school of thought that is more so based on bad experience. Side effects. My auntie took such and so and it didn't help her. Or this happened over here, right? These different things. And so there becomes this aversion to medication altogether. And we miss the fact that for some people, it helps them. Mm -hmm. Everybody's journey is going to look very different. And that's one of the things that we discussed too. On the phone, we were like, okay, this is early in the journey. I know you want to help these saints. But you might need to save yourself. We, we talked about it. <laughs> we did. And you were like, well, you know, we can still record it, put, you know, put it out there, try to help the people. Right. Because there's right. a portion of the journey and for where you are, right, where you got to figure out what works. Mm -hmm. And that is hard. It's very hard. And so it takes about three to six months um, in a lot of scenarios, not all, but in a lot of scenarios to really figure out what set of medications, what dosage, time of day that you take it blah, 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 what actually works for you. Mm -hmm. That can be a hard three to six months for somebody that's already been going through something. And so all of that can create this aversion to just say no and reject it altogether. Um, and I get that. I don't ever right. want to discount that and be disrespectful of that. But I think for people that keep hitting the same wall, can we try? Right. If it does right. work for you, you want that benefit, right? You want to experience that. Um, yeah. So I know I said a lot there, 
but I think the the ultimate moral of the story is I know that there's a lot of uh, skepticism and a lot right. of people had some bad experiences. I was blessed to work with some really amazing psychiatrists during my time working in those different centers. And so that helped me to see it from a different perspective and to really see I've had people sit on my couch who were so anxious. They were physically shaking. And we spent mm. most of the session just trying to get to a place of like, you know, they got on the medicine. The, med the medicine kept getting increased over time. The physical symptoms subsided. And we were able to actually deal with the root of the anxiety. They got better. Once they got better, I was able to work with the psychiatrist. We lowered the dosage and brought it back down. Mm. They needed that. And so I don't want somebody that needs it to miss it because of all the other stuff that's happening out in the world. Right. Yeah. I, I've, and I, I, I empathize with them because I was a, you know, I was, I was skeptic. There's a reason why I called you because mm -hmm. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm completely sold, you know, yep. and the biggest reason, and this is, this is me being a hundred percent honest. Um, as a man, I felt weak having to admit that I need help at that level. Mm -hmm. And I felt insufficient. I felt insecure. I felt like, why do I like, you know, I, I remember kept hearing the voice like, you're not as strong as you think you are. Like you thought you were stronger, but you're not. And listen to the psychiatrist. My, I mean, my, my intake took, I think, I mean, he, he quoted me an hour. We probably went an hour, 45, almost two hours of him just asking oh, me question after question after question. Yes. I mean, I was like, okay. I mean, but he, he went through it every, he went through everything. He explained everything thoroughly and he just got finished. And, and he was like, he said, there are some definite issues here. Mm -hmm. And then he just started to break things down. But I remember thinking, Brittany, like, yo, I feel so weak having to take this stuff. And and that that was a that was a big problem for me. And I'm beginning to see that I'm not the only person who finds that to be an impediment to being able to move forward and saying, hey, if this is something that I need. I should at least try it. Yeah. Yeah. We have to understand how we define strength. I love that. Keep going, please. <laughs> and I know, I know my my black and you know brothers and sisters out there. We tired of talking about slavery. We sick of. We don't want to mention it no more. We ready to be free. Take me back to Nigeria. You know, <laughs> I think I'm 85 percent Nigerian too. You know, I'm here for it. The reality of it is that <laughs> there are things that were embedded in how we operate mm. that start there. And it's still real today. Wow. How we define strength can be rooted in, you know, the experience of our enslaved ancestors. Mm. And we got to finally call it. I mean, I think we, we talked about it. We allude to it. We get angry about it. But to really call it what it is and say that I'm calling something strong that they had to do. You know, I mean, what enslaved person was given the right to cry because they felt sad? Like, what? You know what I mean? If you cry, you could get beaten. You could get killed. Your children could be taken away. So it was purely survival. That gets embedded in how you think, mm -hmm. how you function in life. And then you got Big Mama or whoever who's two generations away from that, three generations away. That's still how we're taught to think. I have to be strong. The You know, they walked across the bridge in Selma, what, 50 years ago, 54 years ago, right? right? Like, they were, there was a level of physical unrest and not being safe that has been embedded in how we think. Hmm. And so the idea of being strong that has been passed down, specifically in our community, other people struggle with it too. It's not just a black thing, but we talking, we we here, we talking right, about right. 
said primarily black men is who you've been talking to. So this is where it's coming from, my brother. <laughs> right? You know what I mean? That there was a there was a very real physical challenge and unrest that we were faced with. And it caused us to define strength based on our ability to survive. Mm. Mm. Some of that still exists in our world today. George Floyd, mm. right? I, Breonna Taylor, we could go down the list. There's still a physical unrest that exists in our black experience today. And so this idea of being strong is very closely connected to survival. And what we have to start to dissect and recognize is that we are being strong to our detriment. Ciao. I said a lot. I'm going to tell you why that hits me so hard, Brittany. Mm -hmm. So I feel like, you know, I don't know how, I don't, I don't know. I've, I've been, I feel like my wife and I have been able to have some, some real conversations because I feel like I'm finally able to, you know, use my tools and separate things. Um, and one of the conversations we just had was, I said to her, I said, you know, I apologize because I said, um, I now see how much I've been pushing you away. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because I grew up in survival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I grew up in, I mean, my, my household was survival mode. It was like, I was a latchkey kid. My mom had to work. She didn't get home until later. We were, you know, it was, you know, my sister and I, we, we, we were the kids who had to take the, the, the meat out the refrigerator, make sure it was thawed out before she got home. Um, yeah. When we got home, I had to learn, I, I learned how to cook when I was four years old. Yeah. You know, I had to, when the VCR broke, I didn't, I couldn't take it to the place to get it fixed. I had to learn how to fix it myself. I had to learn how to fix my Nintendo when it wasn't working or how to, you know, fix the window when it was broken. So it was like, I grew up in survival mode and then everybody around me was in survival mode. Mm -hmm. And so when I get into situations of pressure, I retreat inward and say, I got to figure it out myself. Yeah. And so when my wife would come to me and say, here, I'm here to help you, I would push her away and say, no, 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 no. I don't need your help. I don't need mm -hmm. you. No, just do you do your own thing. You got it. You know, you, you know, it's working for you over here. You do that. I'm going to do me. And man, that survival thing going all the way back into, into, you know, ancestry. I mean, because with all of the black men, all of the, all of the black men that I've ever seen and looked up to, in my life, I feel like they've always operated in survival mode. Yeah. That they call strength. It works. It gets the job done, right? If I stay in survival, I know I'm gonna get the check. I know I'm gonna get this. I know I'm gonna, mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna have food, I'm gonna be able to provide. There are results attached, even in slavery, right? If I just do it this way, I will stay alive. Jesus. Right. If I, you know, if they take my kids, I'll just love on who we got. You know, you just kind of make it work and there's results tied to it. You have to ask yourself, am I tired of these results? Just because I, I'm getting them, are they optimal? And if we bring in Jesus, is this really what God has for me? We have a gift in this day and age that we live in. Is life hard? Yes. Is the world a scary, dangerous place? Yes. He told us it was, though. The gift that we have is that we can look at and conceptualize all of these things that have happened to us and around us and make a decision about how we want to move forward. Mm. And so, and we don't have to move forward based off of anybody's um, limits. Wow. Wow. So, my last question to you, Brittany, is <clears throat> what do you say to the spouses out there that are beating their head up against the wall because they have a spouse that is not 
getting help mm-hmm. and is they the, the the wife can look at her husband and tell this man is depressed this man is anxious this man is this but he's doing the same thing that you know i just explained that i was doing to my wife he's pushing her away he yeah. is he doesn't feel like he's a provider. He doesn't feel like he's a protector. He doesn't feel like anything is working for him right now. And he's spiraling out of control. What do you say to the spouse who is in that supportive role, who feels like I'm ready to quit and give up? Like now the me supporting them is starting to affect me because that's how it was, it was becoming with Heather. Heather was like, babe, I want to be here to support you. But now me supporting you is making me depressed. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you say to the spouse? And then what do you say to that other person and and another person who may not be married, the other person who finds themselves in that dark place and they don't, they give them that extra motivation or whatever it is that's going to say, Hey, go get the help you need. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think the reality is, is that this highlights the fact that loneliness can exist inside of marriage. Well, all right. <laughs> you know, a lot of people think that marriage is going to provide a solution. I'm not married. I don't pretend to know everything that there is about marriage. I have spent a lot of time understanding human behavior. Mm-hmm. And that is my area of expertise. Um, and so loneliness can exist inside of marriage. And so recognizing that just because I'm married does not mean I have a 24-7 hero a 24 seven um, companion, a 24 seven, whatever they're human that will go through difficult experiences. And so you really have to understand the art of not giving too much of your power away. Mm. If Heather gives you all of her power to be her hero, she's screwed. Mm. You know, if, if you give her, she's always happy and I, Everybody, and she really is like that. Like all the right. time, it's a little bit weird. It's a little bit, you know. It's like, girl, but I love it though. You know? yes, yes. Um, but what if she falls? Mm. What if you give her all that power and say, you know what, Heather, I'm gonna give it all. You're always happy. I'm gonna give you all of it. What if she has a bad day? You're screwed. Yeah. And so you you have to recognize that marriage is not a solution to problems because people have problems. And Mm -hmm. so you're going to go through things. And I think every individual spouse needs something different. Mm -hmm. I will say this, when you're very depressed and very anxious, your perception of what you need is skewed. Mm -hmm. So being careful to not push your spouse away. When really, you know, well, the Bible says, he who findeth a wife finds a good thing and receives favor Mm -hmm. from the Lord, which means there's favor for your life attached to her. And so if she's trying to help you, it would be wise to receive that favor. Mm -hmm. Because it says it plainly in the book. And so don't allow pride to keep you from the gift that God said you, you was going to have when you went and found this good thing. And for the good thing, i.e. in your case, Heather, don't put your hope in this man being everything you need him to be because he's not going to be able to do it all the time. Right. It doesn't mean that you're a bad spouse or that y'all have a bad marriage. It could have bad times. But we got to we got to understand that, like, the end all be all is not in this person. You know, something I just want to make this this little comment, what you just said, how when you're going through it is skewed. I always felt like I just need to be by myself. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting because about a week and a half ago, maybe two weeks ago, Heather was like, she said, I don't know what to give you. I don't know. She's like, I met my wits in. I don't know what to give you. And I blurted out and I said something that scared the crap out of me, Brittany. I said, just give me a hug. And she was like, 
You? you know, me, like you, the Mr. Mr. You know, don't want to hug nobody, don't want to touch that. Give me a hug. And, I, and it scared the crap out of me, but it was like, just give me a hug. Mm -hmm. And so what she has done is she'll see, like, I'll be, I'll be sitting down in front of the laptop and she'll make see me with my head down or something. And she'll come up from behind me and she'll give me a hug and give me a kiss on the cheek. And Brittany, I feel like when she does that, I'm like, oh, wow. And I didn't even recognize how I was starving myself from that, mm -hmm. from the healing power of touch. Because like in my head, it was like, nope, you just need to separate. You need to just stay by yourself. You just get away, get away, get away. But yo, the hug, I told her, yeah, I was like, yo, I want to be the little spoon. Like, you got to cuddle me. <laughs> like, like, yo, like, I love it. Yeah. Like, this is amazing. Yo, yeah. like, I didn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't see that because it was so, it was just so, everything was just so skewed in my head. Yeah, it gets dark. It gets really dark. And what, what the enemy wants you to believe is that you need to be alone mm. and completely isolated and that you're stuck. Mm. And that's just simply not true. It's not yeah. true. And you can spend so much time with a lie that you believe it. Jesus. And so a big part of this journey is, this is the uh, illustration that I use often. When you've been anxious or depressed for a very long time, this is you. This is your mm -hmm. personality, your being, all of that. This is the anxiety, the depression, whatever. They're like this. Right. And it's hard to know who's talking, who's right. saying what, who's doing what. Right? Oh, hold, on, hold on a second, Brick. Hold on a second. Bro. Hold on a second bro. Uh -huh. Okay, please. Thank you. Look at me. I'm all nosy. I was like, who over there? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I think it was I think it was room service. <laughs> that is so funny. I think and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, who is, I think it was room service. Oh, I don't, I don't know. He he's gonna come back, but okay, yeah. I'm sorry. Keep no, going. no, no, you're good, you're good. The two become very intertwined. Mm -hmm. And so a major portion of this journey is separating them mm -hmm. and being able to call them out. And I think for you in your role as a pastor, as a dad, as a husband, you've been so busy putting all your energy and separating them for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Jesus. And I love your heart to, you know, want to, you know, do the right thing, do for Jesus, all the things. I love that, but I'm going to say it again. And I'm saying it not just for you, but also for the people in the back, that sometimes you got to save yourself. And you're in the thick of this journey. You just started the meds, right? That was a huge breakthrough to even be like, I'm willing. Right. You right. know, and I can't promise you, nor the psychiatrist can promise you that it's going to be smooth. Right. You may have to change meds. You may have to up the dosage. You may have to combine it with something else. You may have to add on an as needed medicine for when it pops up right like this this may not be a smooth whoo i'm good right you know um but what i want to encourage you and everybody that's listening and following and and that needs the additional support is to just do not give up i love that and recognize that what you are gaining through the process is tools resources and abilities that you did not previously have. Mm. Just like asking Heather for that hug. You know now, even if even if your instinct is to resist it, is that it helps. That's a tool. Right. right. That's a tool. So when you have that feeling come back up, you can say, all right, you know, you need a hug. Just admit it. Admit it. Go get your little hug and come on now. Right. right? And so that can help you to actually go forward. I love that. Well, in response, I won't quit. I'll keep going. Um, so how do the people, how do they find you? How do they reach out to you? How do they contract you for services? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. Um, so I have a website, imaginationbeautiful.com. Um, it's a pretty straightforward site. They're welcome to go there. Check it out. Um, you can, uh, you know, call 
or click the button to go into the client portal <laughs> um, and request an appointment. I have an assistant who'll be happy to help you if you have any questions. Uh, the one stipulation, I guess you could say, I am licensed as a therapist in Tennessee and Georgia. And so those are the clients that I do therapy with. I am expanding into doing some emotional wellness coaching um, for people outside of Tennessee and Georgia. So you will not see that on the website. If you go at the time that we're recording, this It's like February of 24. It ain't up yet. But, you know, if you're watching this later in life, it may be. So there's that. <laughs> I absolutely love it. Uh, Brittany, yeah, again. That's, that's it. Sorry, what were you saying? No, no, I'll I love it. Uh, I'm I'm so appreciative of who you are. Um, so like I said in the beginning, I can't, my wife and I cannot speak highly enough of the person that you are because you have always been so authentic. From the moment that we met you, you have always been so authentic. And I think it really shows in your practice. Mm. Uh, it shows in your wisdom. Um, just watching your journey has been special. It's been amazing. And it's been uh, extremely uplifting for me and my wife and my entire family. Um, so I just, I thank you. I even thank you for taking out your time right now to being able to have this discussion with me. And I, my, my prayer is that, you know, it really touches somebody out there. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate y'all. You know, I love y'all too or whatever. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Brittany. Yeah, of course. All right.